Reading from the Gospel of John, chapter 20, starting at verse 19. It was still the first day of the week. That evening, while the disciples were behind closed doors because they were afraid of the Jewish authorities, Jesus came and stood among them. He said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. When the disciples saw the Lord, they were filled with joy. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father sent me, so I am sending you. Then he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, they are forgiven. If you don't forgive them, they aren't forgiven. Now Thomas, the one called Didymus, which means twin, one of the twelve, wasn't with the disciples when Jesus came. The other disciples told him, We've seen the Lord. But he replied, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands, put my finger in the wounds left by the nails, and put my hand into his side, I won't believe. After eight days, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Even though the doors were locked, Jesus entered and stood among them. He said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. Look at my hands. Put your hand into my side. No more disbelief. Believe. Thomas responded to Jesus, My Lord and my God. Jesus replied, Do you believe because you see me? Happy are those who don't see and yet believe. Then Jesus did many other miraculous signs in his disciples' presence, signs that aren't recorded in this scroll. But these, are the, these things are written so that you will believe that Jesus is the Christ, God's Son, and that believing you will have life in his name. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Please be seated. I invite you to pray with me. Dear Lord, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight this day and always. We pray in Jesus' name and faith. Amen. So, so during Lent, for the last two years now, I've encouraged you all to undertake a spiritual practice. And I know many of you have, to my, to my delight. And... Some of you even added a second one this year, and the hope is that you'll continue with that spiritual practice throughout the year and not just make it a Lenten thing, but a lifelong habit. Now, if you haven't done that, there's still these flyers. They're they're downstairs in the thing. I don't think there's any more in the back, but they're downstairs in the magazine rack, and um, it's still a good time to start. You can start doing your spiritual practices any time that you like. Now, we... After Christmas, we started with the Sermon on the Mount, if you remember, and that was some really tough lessons in there, some tough preaching, and, uh, you know, it got tougher from there. Uh, Lent is a time when we really look at ourselves and, um, you know, try and better ourselves, better align ourselves with Christ and, you know, take those spiritual disciplines more seriously and make them, you know, more a part of our everyday life. And Monday, Thursday, we celebrated the Last Supper. Good Friday, we showed that movie with the discipleship, right? Remember that, the movie In Remembrance? And, uh, you know, I bet you never really thought how, how much those disciples gave up to follow Christ. And at the same time, how much those disciples were dysfunctional, just like the rest of us, right? I mean, the movie's pretty, uh, pretty deep in that regards. Um, then on Easter Sunday, we were talking about unexpected Christ sightings, right, and how that strengthens our faith, and that's still what we're talking about today, because if you look at the Bible story from last week and today, and there was nothing skipped out of the middle, Mary Magdalene was the first one at the tomb, right, and later on, she saw Jesus, he was talking to her, right, but did she recognize him? She didn't recognize him, she thought that, that he was the gardener. So here Mary Magdalene is talking to Jesus directly, and he's the gardener in her eyes at first, right? Um, James, who, who are the ones that ran to the tomb? Not James. Who ran to the tomb? John and uh, Peter. Peter, of course. Peter and John ran to the tomb, and they found it open, and they saw the empty tomb and believed, right? 
but they believed that the tomb was empty. They didn't, their, their faith wasn't full. They didn't really understand that Christ was back and alive and resurrected in physical form. But yet Easter is the very pinnacle of our faith, right? You envision a pinwheel that turns around. It spins on that center point, right? As Christians, Easter is the very center of our faith. We believe in the resurrected Christ. We believe that Jesus is alive and well and living today. But yet, we have unbelief, do we not? We all have unbelief. We all have signs or, or times where we need signs. And that's what we're talking about today. The disciples, Mary Magdalene went right to the disciples Easter morning. They didn't believe her. What were they doing? They were locked in a room. If they had believed her, they would not have been locked in a room. So the disciples, they needed a sign. They needed to see Jesus alive for themselves. And they did, Easter evening. This actually starts, the reading today is, starts at Easter evening. Right? But Thomas wasn't with them. And, you know, we call Doubting Thomas the great Doubting Thomas. And, you know, I'm not going to preach about him because I did earlier this year. But, uh, you know, we've got to stand up for Thomas a little bit here because he was one of the bravest disciples in reality. And he was requiring proof just like the rest of them. Mary didn't see him. The disciples didn't believe. But yet we get down on Thomas, right? I think we get down on Thomas because we don't believe we struggle with our faith at times as well. But you see that cycle going through, throughout the gospel reading, especially in John. Now, many of us, and I, I, hope, I hope and trust that this is true, are changed by the Easter story, whether it was this Sunday or whether it's been a past Sunday or whether it's been past experiences in our life. But the Easter story changes us. In a lot of ways, it changes us in ways that we never thought possible. It changes us in ways we never thought imaginable. I mean, I came to accept Christ in my late 20s, and I'll tell you something. I am changed in every way imaginable because of that. I was arrogant. I was self-centered. I was, uh, you know, pompous. I would put anybody down. I would, I would debate anybody just to win. I was... Nasty, nasty, right? Still do that sometimes, but I'm not, you know, it's not the center part of my, what are you laughing at, Jan, right? Yeah. <laughs> but it's not the center of myself. I, I am a very, very different person that I have Christ in my life. And you've probably even know I'm a different person than I was three years ago when I started here with you. And I'd imagine three years ago from now, I'll be a different person as you guys meet me. And, you know, I see the same growth in Christ in many of you. And that's what's pretty exciting about ministry. That's what keeps me going. That's what gets me excited about, you know, preaching on, on the, the Word of God each and every Sunday. So, in, in some level, we have all been changed by the resurrection story because we're not who we are. We're not who we want to be, but we're not who we were. But what happened this week, right? The world didn't change, did it? The world is still the same world it was last Sunday. It's still the same world it was 2,000 years ago. You know, this week, Hamas is still threatening Israel with terrorism. The Russians are still threatening the Ukraine. Um, our government leaders are completely dysfunctional and have no hope of, of becoming functional in the next, uh, how many years? Who knows, right? The world hasn't changed. There's still, you know, murders that happened this week. There were still, you know, rapes and robberies. There were still people cheating. There's still hunger. There's still poverty and homelessness, right? All of these things still exist in the world. So where do we fit in here, right? You know, we, we have been changed by the resurrected Christ, but yet we still are in this world that hasn't changed. Anybody catch what Jesus said to his disciples? Right? He said, peace be with you. But what did he say? Something about being sent. Anybody catch it? 
God sent me to you, and now I send you. Right? He sends... Jesus is sending his disciples, and there's something else that's really significant in John. Remember, John is all about signs. Jesus breathed into them, right? That goes all the way back to Genesis when Jesus breathed, or Jesus, when God breathed life into Adam and Eve, okay? Jesus breathed life into the disciples at that point. Remember, the disciples were the ones that were going to be trusted with the church, those dysfunctional group of guys that you saw in the movie Friday night on Good Friday. Those are the ones he chose to leave his church to because they were changed by the resurrection story. They were changed by the fact that that tomb was empty, but it didn't end there. They were changed by the fact that Jesus Christ came to them and entrusted his church to them. And that's what he's doing with us. He's entrusting his church to them. You've heard me say that a hundred times, and I'm going to say it a hundred more times. We are the disciples of Christ today. We are the ones that Jesus is trusting his church to, to reach out to that world that hasn't changed. And we do that one soul at a time. And, you know, we we talk about, you know, I, I try, I try, I try, but I don't know if I'm doing what I should be doing. And, you know, I struggle with the same stuff. Coming into Easter season, you know, I'm struggling with the same thing because one of the things that drives me is impatience. I'm a very impatient person. It goes right to the heart of my soul. I'm not so impatient with people, but myself, terrible on myself about that, right? So, you know, I'm starting to think going into Lent, you know, it's been three years. I'm here three years. You know, why, why, why are we not expanding? Why are we not doing all of these crazy things, you know, why don't we have 100 kids every Sunday in Sunday school, and I could go on and on and on about what I was beating myself up with Lent. And what is that? That's a lack of faith, right? It's a lack of faith. Do I believe or do I not believe that Christ is with us? And you know, I required some signs. And Christ met me where I was, and he gave me some signs. You guys remember about a year and a half ago, I had my friend from Branchville and his wife come down, Charlie and and Kathy. And after they had left, I didn't tell them ahead of time, but after they had left, I asked them to, you know, tell us what they thought about their church, their experience here. And, you know, Charlie, if nothing else, is a brutally honest guy. And, you know, he told us they got here and couldn't find the bathrooms. He told us once he found the bathroom, the men's room light didn't work, okay? Okay. he, he told us that once he got upstairs, there were no greeters to greet them or show them a bulletin or help them out in any way. And one of our guests that day actually greeted them and handed him a bulletin, um, talked about our uh, cheesy uh, uh, Christmas decorations that were outside and they had blown over and, you know, how dated they were. And, you know, was brutally honest with us, right? And I, I read that letter to, to most of you. So this was their experience. They came last month, and he wrote this note. Uh, Dear Buttsville Congregation, we appreciate, and I didn't solicit this, okay? So, dear Buttsville Congregation, we appreciate the warm welcome we received when we visit your church. Keep up the smiling welcomes and the work you do for the community. God be with you and bless you, Kathy and Charlie Porter. That's pretty cool, all right? Folks, that's a sign I needed, all right? I needed to have that sign, I had another sign here. I don't remember which one, what it was. Last night, I had some more signs. I'll go right to those. Last night, there was a fella from the uh, St. John's Church. And he read the flyers. And I know, I know, who who are the waitresses? Raise your hand. I know I exasperate you all with those flyers. I know, okay? I know. (laughs) But this is why I do it, okay? This guy came up to me last night from St. John's Church, and he's an avid gardener, and he was, you know, impressed that we're doing the garden and asked what we do with the vegetables. And he says, you know, at my house, I grow this tremendous garden, and, uh, you know, I can't even give them to all my friends, so I'm cutting back and cutting back. Well, who who was at St. John's? Uh, Maureen was there the night that they had those uh, people come 
and it's a Girl Scout working on her Gold Award and another organization that's just starting up, and they will go to your house, pick up the vegetables, and bring them to area food pantries in Warren and Sussex County. So I was able to connect this man with that ministry that's starting right in their own church, and he didn't know it. Because we have those silly pain-in-the-neck flyers on the table, Holly. <laughs> Holly even writes, makes the flyers, you know? It's a dichotomy, isn't it, right? You're cursed with the very flyers you create, you know. I know. I'm not picking on you, really. There's another fella. He came to the dinner, uh, I guess, in October. And I know him as Bob the Presbyterian. That helps me to remember, uh, remember names, you know. And Bob the Presbyterian was impressed with our missions uh, flyer that we have on the table. And this was last October. And, uh, you know, he talked to me extensively at the last dinner about, you know, how we're doing that and, and how, you know, how we accomplish that in such a small congregation as we are. And, you know, we talked for a while, and he showed up again last night. Now, last night he, he made the point of finding me because we didn't encounter each other. He made the point of finding me, and he goes, you know, I've been looking in that kitchen, and I can't believe how well your congregation works together. All right? Folks, that's a sign, okay? That's a sign I needed because, you know, the pastor means shepherd, okay? And sometimes the sheep bite, you know? Sometimes in our, 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 our moments of stress and our moments of, uh, you, know, you know, annoyance, we bite each other, you know, and we say hurtful things to one another. But that was pretty cool hearing from Bob the Presbyterian watching you guys so that he can take that back to his church. That's pretty cool because we're all on the same side. And if Bob, watching you guys work, helps strengthen his church, is that not all what we're, 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 we're all about? Right? That's a sign. And you know, I was pleading for a sign from God that we're on the right track, and I got several. So don't tell me you don't need signs, all right? The book of John is all about signs because... The, the early church in the year 70, when the temple had been torn down and the Christians that were mixed in with the Jews in the synagogues were threatened to get thrown out, they needed a sign that they were on the right track. And that's why the Gospel of John is written. And that Gospel has been helping all of us throughout Lent and now after Lent and through Easter, you know, through Easter and now post-Easter. Don't believe me about the signs? These last two verses that I'm about to read to you, I just read them, but I'm going to read them again, is believed by scholars to be the actual end of the book of John. Chapter 21, which is just a page and a quarter afterwards, they believe that was added later so that it further complied with uh, you know, the other three Gospels. But the Gospel of John, as the original writer most likely read it, wrote it, said, then Jesus did many other miraculous signs in his disciples' presence, signs that aren't recorded in this scroll, but these things are written so that you will believe that Jesus is the Christ, God's Son, and that believing you will have life in his name. There's nothing wrong with asking for signs. You know, many, many times getting a sign helps you with the discernment process. Because just because I was called to serve Boy Scouts for 11 years doesn't mean I'm called to serve Boy Scouts anymore. You follow me? My calling has changed. So sometimes we have to seek out those signs so that we are in tune with our calling. Because if we just keep doing the same thing over and over again because it's expected or it's the right thing to do, we're missing out. So there's nothing wrong with asking for signs. I think Eric and I had an honest discussion this week, too, about the roast beef dinner. And I got three signs, loud and clear, last night that uh, I know I needed to hear, you know. So, folks, keep up the good work. Keep up the good work. And when I get hard and harsh on you, because I'm impatient. I am very impatient. But I love you all. So go out and change the world. Nothing less, nothing more. Thank you. Just a little bit. I don't know, Cliff. What are we going to sing? What are we going to sing? What are we going to sing? What are we going to sing?